How many of you have ever had a non-dual experience? <laughs> Recently? Well, I had one when I was six years old, and it influenced everything that I did. As he said, can you hear me all right? Okay. I'm half Sicilian, he made that very, the other half is Texas Scotch, but what can you do? <laughs> And my Sicilian mother, Maria Nunziata, Serafina Graziella, Fiorina Perpetu Tedaro, born in Syracuse, married Jack Houston of Texas. <laughs> but he could only get married if he promised any kids came along, I'd be raised Catholic, at least for a while. So um, I went to St. Ephraim's Catholic School in Brooklyn, or as they said, in the Sicilian section of Brooklyn, e Brooklyn, can you say that? <laughs> no, no, you have to hear it, e Brooklyn. Okay. And um, everything was okay except my father who wrote the Bob Hope Show and also that joke, who's on first? Everything was funny and he thought my catechism was hilarious and he gagged up my catechism. Well, then there were the questions. Sister Teresa? I counted my ribs and I counted my friend Joey Mangiabella's ribs and we got the same number of ribs and what I want to know, if God made Eve out of Adam's rib, how come, one, two, three, and every child lifted their, their undershirt to prove we had the same number of ribs, the girls and the boys. Or Sister Teresa, when Ezekiel saw the wheel, was he drunk? Or <laughs> Sister Teresa, these were my questions, when Jesus rose, was that because God filled him full of helium? <laughs> well, this went on. And finally, the, the question, and the little nun was getting very flustered, and uh, finally, the question, which frankly upsets the soul of many little Catholic children, Sister Teresa, yes, she had a lisp. Did Jesus ever have to go to the bathroom? That did it. She blew up. She said, blasphemy, blasphemy, sacrilege and blasphemy. And she went, and she pinned up a piece of oak tag, and she wrote, Jean Houston's years in purgatory. <laughs> Every time I asked one of these questions, blasphemy, blasphemy, big X. Each X was, was at least 500,000 years. Well, the end of the first, the end of uh, uh, the period, I went home, and I was crying and telling my father, I have to go to purgatory for 300 million years and it's all your fault. He said, great, great, this is so funny. He picks me up, puts me on his shoulders, goes running past the Sicilian neighbors going, purgatory, purgatory, purgatory. <laughs> Here comes the purgatory special. And he takes me to a great movie playing at the time in 1943 called The Song of Bernadette. Any of you remember The Song of Bernadette? Where Bernadette sees the Virgin Mary in the grotto. And we were all filled with a passion of religious intensity, except, unfortunately, when the Virgin Mary shows up on the screen, my father gets into hysterics and he cannot stop. He says, that's old Linda up there playing the Virgin Mary. I know her, I met her at that party in Beverly Hills. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, I said, Daddy, shh, this is the holy part. Anyway, we go home and I am heady with purpose, and I go up to the place where we have a, a guest room, and there was a closet that looked rather like a grotto, and the doggy had just had her nine puppies there, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't want you, to, Virgin Mary, to step on you, and I crossed myself, Virgin Mary, please, 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 show up in the closet like you did for Bernadette. I, I'll give you, a, I'll give out candy for a week, okay? <laughs> Two weeks, okay? And I'll count to 10, <laughs> 10, more dogs in the closet. I kept counting to higher and higher numbers. I kept, I gave up all calories as far as I could, you know. Yeah. And finally I gave up. I gave up and I went over and sat by the, the, the bay window and I looked down and there was my grandfather, Prospero Tadaro, bending down to try to put a, a smudge pot under the tree. He knew of his feet only by rumor, because his stomach began here, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, and suddenly it all shifted. I didn't see or hear anything different. All I can tell you, friends, is the world moved into meaning. 
And I knew absolutely that I and the fig trees in the yard and the plane in the sky and my idea of the Virgin Mary and all the puppies and new wheat in Kansas and the little boy who used to wave at me when we went by on the train and sheep and the, the old ladies at, at Shore Road Hospital. Everything was there, everything was there. And it was united in this incredible, great, singular, non-dual beingness, a kind of evolution of, of everything with everything else, everything interconnected. It was like a great, great symphony of fellowship and deep mutual integration. Everything was present. And then my father came in laughing, which was typical, and immediately the whole universe began to laugh great, joyous, ecstatic laughing. Um, years later, when I could read Dante and the original, the final lines of the, of the uh, Divine Comedy, del riso dell'universo, the joy that spins the universe. And that's what it was. And I knew I was an intimate part of it. In fact, there was no difference between me and all that was there. And that story happened in 1943. And in this world now, it continues to lure me. It lures me to deeper ways of knowing. I mean, the mystical experience is perhaps the greatest accelerator of evolutionary enhancement, often, generally, non-dual in nature. Through it, we tap into a wider physical, mental, emotional system, gaining entrance, I believe, into the next stage of our unfolding individually and collectively. Once the province of the too few, I do believe, my friends, that the mystic path has now become the requirement of the many, the unique developmental path for self and world. So, in a lifetime of studying the art and science of human development, I have found no more powerful, practical, evolutionary practice than what is known as the mystic path. And when I have studied or talked with seekers who have had this experience, they've told me of the joy that passes understanding, an immense surge of creativity, an instant uprush of kindness and tolerance that makes them impassioned champions for the betterment of all, bridge builders, magnets for solutions, peacemakers, pathfinders, best of all, other people feel both enriched and nourished around them. Everything they touch becomes more because they are more. And I do believe that we, have here, then we need change and acceleration in our time, do we not? And I think that the mystic experience puts the flame under the crucible of becoming so that such inward alchemy can take place. Now, you should know that mysticism, when it rises, as it's happening now, it rises during times of intense change and stress. And wouldn't you agree that the current shadows and breakdown of all certainties, the, the full titling, what should we say, full system transition that we're in, where more and more history is happening faster and faster than we can make sense of, it needs the mystic path. Now many have traced that path and its myriad adventures, its planes of development, but I found that Evelyn Underhill's magnificent work, written in 1911, on mysticism is the best. And I'm gonna follow that and try to weave it into what I think is happening with the understanding of the non-dual universe. So, in the first stage, first stage is awakening. Awakening, how many have ever awakened? I mean, really, really awaken. The world is filled with splendor and glory and one understands that one is a citizen in a much larger universe. You don't just live in the universe, the universe lives in you. You are part of an enormous life, an enormous life. And however it happens, something in one wakes up and when it does, it moves through all our parts. It seems to reconstitute the whole. 
It is a kind of flood tide of a huge wave of being, and our local self seems swept away, not permanently, it generally comes back. But it feels like a second birth, and it can be as profound as our first. It is the quickening, I believe, of the God seed in you that has been waiting to emerge. And your perception is so keen. Your inner and outer life are one. And that's very happy when it happens. How many of you had that experience of awakening? Let me see. Quite a few, no. Now the second stage of the mystical development is called purgation or purification. Mm. What goes up must come down. <laughs> Here one thinks, oh, look what I've had and what a lousy bum I am. I've got to do something. So you begin to actively rid yourself of those veils and obstruction of the ordinary, unexamined life that keeps you from the knowledge that you had gained from awakening. You feel yourself, you've got to do what you have to do to be released from old ways of being and recover a higher innocence. Hmm. Now, in traditional mystical experiences, it can be very intense, ascetic. You think of poor old Buddha, and what did he do? He, he began to, he walked in a squat for miles. He ate noxious foods. He slept on charred corpses. He ate so little that when he pressed his belly button, he felt his backbone, you know. That mean, it, and finally he said, why am I doing this? My body is what I've got to achieve my enlightenment. Why am I doing these stupid things? And he went and of course he laid down in some waters and the waters washed over. And then a very nice lady <coughs> brought him curds and he began to come back and find enlightenment. Now, I believe that this state is one in which there are alternate ways of achieving the cleaning up of your act. And if you have had years of therapy, but have you had therapeia, the original word for therapy, theoropeia, which it could be translated roughly as the art of doing the work of the God. And there you tend to go in for restorative justice. How many of you work with people in need? Let me just see this. How many of you clean up terrible places with happiness? How many of you go out of your way, and it's not an out way, it's an in way, to give solace and consolation to others who deeply need it? How many of you work because of the great issues of climate change? How many of you teach children the fullness of they are with art as central to the curriculum? Yes? I mean, there's so many ways that we can do this. Another way is what Rumi called conscious suffering. So, I would say, <clears throat> because I have suffered, I have found an incredible way of understanding the suffering of others and sharing it. Because I have suffered, it's a wonderful exercise. Another, remember what Rumi said, conscious suffering. And what is conscious suffering? Well, you think of, he talks about, ah, oh, the grapes, they have to be crushed and fermented before they become gorgeous. Only five minutes left? You're kidding. Okay, never mind. But anyway, there's things like that. Well, okay. Anyway, that's the thing. Now, the, the third way is illumination. One is illumined in the light. The light of bliss pervades everything. One sees beauty and manner and meaning everywhere, everywhere. And this is a place that many artists and writers and visionaries and scientists, they have through this light access to the very creative process of the universe itself. And even your imagination is transcended because your imagination 
is down into, what should we call it, the imaginal realm that contains the seeds and potencies of everything that exists, including yourself as a divine idea, and you meet yourself in a divine idea. The fourth stage, voices and visions, one sees, one hears, one senses with more than five senses, an amplitude of reality. Visionary, this is something I work on, time. We can show people how to have hours of time in two minutes of clock time. These are some of the things that can, po can become possible. You, you can also, um, you can enter, uh, because time in quantum physics is simultaneous, past, present, future, it's simultaneous which means that you can actually enter past time and shift minor things that then have a profound effect on the present. You can enter into parallel realities and meet a version of yourself who maybe have much better health or generalize better points of view or even have a kind of access to the depths that you didn't think you had and because you're in the great energetic Hmm, oneness of oneness. <laughs> anyway, and, and then there's, the, there's joy, there's ecstasy, there's celebration, there is spiritual ecstasy. But unfortunately, all this joy and rapture, the dark night of the soul comes along, and what was up goes way down, and the beloved is not there and one is literally bereft of everything. Here you face the remaining shadows of the old forms, but you know what's going on? There's a kind of shutting down of the local sense of the self because there in the deeper realms of consciousness you are being remade, repatterned, recreated so that you can live the emergent evolutionary life. And finally, the eighth and last stage is called the unit of life. And at this stage, one exists in a state of union with the one reality all the time. One is both oneself and God. And nothing is impossible. Everything becomes possible. You become world changers, world servers. You become powers for life, centers for energy, guides for spiritual vitality and others. You are a force field. You are a God seed who is becoming godded, and I do believe this is the planet which has a sufficient amount of worry, change, complexity, that this is actually the planet in which we evolve into what we think of as gods or higher forces of co-creation in this glorious universe. Thank you. Thank you.